If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace in which you trusted, they wearied you, then how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? For even your brothers, the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Yes, they have called a multitude after you. Do not believe them, even though they speak smooth words to you. That was Jeremiah 12, verses 5 and 6. You know, I just, I've been spending some time with the Lord this evening, and I just am feeling the weight of, you know, just what he's been talking to me about the season that we're in right now. And, you know, there's some things that we're really experiencing as the body of Christ, and we're in this uh, divine pivot point, and it's kind of like a, it's like a three-month window that I see that we've entered into, and it, you know, f February, it's begun, February, March, and it's going to go into April, and so, you know, the verse that I just read, it says, if you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, how will you contend with horses, you know, and myself, and I'm sure a lot of you guys listening will find that you have been in this place. You know, there has been this place of contending, this place of running, this place of, you know, being wearied, you know, by the, you know, by the men, by the, the, the hand to hand combat the, the, in this place, you know, and even in, in what had been times of peace, the battles that surrounded us had become wearisome. But now we're in a different era, a different time. We're entering into the promised land. And it says, you know, how will you do in the floodplains of the Jordan? How can you contend with the horses? And so now we're in the floodplains of the Jordan. We're entering into the promised land. And in the promised land, it's not just about blessing and inheritance. It's about war and it's about taking territory just want to say hello, hello, Annette Stevenson, Michael Erickson, Barb Dixon, Tamara Bali. Good to see you guys. Robert Helms, hello. You know, I just want to share some things, you know, so I really, I'm just really feeling heavy on my heart, like that we are in this incredible transition time. And it is like, think of yourself as like in the hallway of your destiny, you know, and we are moving through and things are shifting and they are changing rapidly. And so this is a time that we really have to be so, you know, we have to set our face like Flint and we have to, you know, have our eyes fixed on Jesus. We have to really be guarding our hearts. We have to make sure that we you know, that, that we're tending to the matters of the heart, that we're walking in forgiveness, that we don't allow ourselves to get caught up in offense or the, the things that are swirling and distracting around us, you know, because we are in this beautiful and this precious time, you know, and, you know, a lot of us, we have felt like, you know, the weariness of the last season of the contending, the contention and the weariness you know, that kind of came upon us because there was a lot of um, areas where we didn't rightly discern who our enemy was. And so we, you know, got distracted into thinking, you know, we forget that we're, we're not in a flesh and blood battle, but we are wars against principalities and powers, you know, uh, spiritual powers in heavenly places. You know, it's not, it's not our, our, the people, it's not the people that might be groaning at us or complaining about us or our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not about, you know, the people, but they are vehicles through which sometimes the en enemy, you know, pokes at us, agitates us, tries to get us to pick up an offense and to poke us, you know, and he, and, and he always goes for those wounds in those areas that we don't have fully healed because he wants to get a reaction out of us and, and have us respond in a way out of the flesh rather than out of the spirit and in a way that is actually going to, you know, open the door for the enemy to be able to come and, and have a right. Because, you know, every legal right that the enemy had was taken away. Jesus, Jesus 
you know, he, his death on the cross was so perfect and so complete and he took back all the authority. So we have the authority. That means the enemy should have none. But what happens when we don't stand and we, you know, we don't properly resist the enemy, we actually, if we give him our agreement or we allow him to poke us and then we, you know, respond in a way that is not of the spirit, then, you know, he gets a foothold, but we need to stand and the enemy, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee. And, you know, so I want to encourage you that there is hope for you to have a different response in this season. That just because there was a weariness in the last season and in, in a lot of ways where we came up against the hard places, it, it seemed like failures. It seemed like we had fallen and it seemed, you know, like we had kind of gone backwards in some ways. But what God was doing was really, um, it was a revealing of the weak places, you know, and, and it was in his kindness to allow us to experience an increased pressure so that we could gird ourselves up, be strengthened, realize where we needed to get ourselves, you know, back into proper alignment so that we can stand in this season that we, you know, there's a new vision that has been, you know, given to us through the pain of our past and the pain of mistakes. Now we are able to see more clearly and able to see the wiles and the strategies of the enemy so that the things in the last season that that seem like it's like, wow, why did we get tripped up in that? But now we're going to find ourselves in this new season where it's not just contending with the footmen, but it is like, you know, it is running with the horses. But now there is a new grace and a wisdom for us to be able to stand in this season you know and I saw um one of the stories that God was highlighting to me I just want to say hello Kara Well, Gloria Norija, Sherry Normore hello Charlene Curley Joelle Ledger good to see you guys thanks for tuning in you know another story that was really um really I've just been meditating on this evening and actually, the Lord reminded me of a dream that I had last year, <clears throat> which kind of is pointing to this, this time and season and why I titled the video, The Chariots of Fire Are Coming. And he took me back to where the chariots of fire are in the Bible, and that is in 2 Kings 2. And so we see Elisha has been in this place of serving Elijah, and and he you know gets this sense from the Lord that Elijah's go- or Elijah is going to be taken up you know, he's going to be taken from him and, and, um, you know, he knows that the prophets keep saying it to him, but, you know, Elisha asks Elijah for this double portion, this double portion inheritance, which, which was really, it was the portion of the firstborn. It was, he was like, I, you know, Eli- Elisha, he, he burned the oxen and he, he left his family. He left everything behind to follow Elijah, to serve him, to learn, to be trained up as a prophet. And, you know, for those years that he was serving Elijah, he was not known. He was an unknown prophetic voice, but he served. He was known as the one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And that that was, you know, how they knew. They were just like, okay, well, this is the servant. But, you know, so Elisha knows, okay, <clears throat> you know, we think of it like, oh, well, this is the great moment. Like he gets his 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 double portion he gets his inheritance he picks up the mantle he gets to step in to he gets to step into like the fullness he's been training he's been prepared and it's like i'm feeling the emotion of it now because we think oh this should be an exciting time this is like wow this is incredible like he gets that double portion you know elijah did his seven miracles elisha's going to do double that Hello, Kayla Lopez and Tippy Shakespeare. You know, but it's not, but you have to think about this. Put yourself in Elisha's shoes. Yeah, we're all excited. We want our portion. We want our inheritance. We want our mantle. We want, you know, we all say like mother, spiritual mothers and fathers, give us an impartation, lay hands on us. We want to walk in, in the things that you have walked in. You know, we want to just passively be able to reach out and to grab hold of all the things that they have worked for and that the authority that they've gained through their hard or earned life experiences. But here is Elisha. And I think his heart is not so much on like, oh, I want the double. 
And it's not so much on like, oh, I want, this is about what I'm going to get because I know Elijah had a great ministry, but mine's going to be greater because, you know, I'm going to have the portion of the first. That wasn't his heart at all, but he knew who he was. Elisha knew who he was and he wasn't Elijah's natural son, but he was Elijah's spiritual son and firstborn son. Before him, Elijah was a lone ranger. He thought he was all alone. And God was like, you're a mess, Elijah. You need to go anoint Elisha, get yourself into family, into community, and like train up this next generation because you are not in a place of health that you're going to be able to carry out the assignment on your life, which was to, you know, was to bring an end to Jezebel. He wasn't able to do it as a lone ranger prophet, you know? And so here is Elisha comes in, you know? And so, but Elisha, so my submission to you is that he was not so excited about like, Oh, what I'm going to get from Elijah. He knew the Lord was going to take him away. He knew that his father was leaving and that on that day he would be taken away from him. And it is a time, it would be a time of deep grief and of mourning. He served Elijah and has walked with him. He has loved him. He has become a son to him. And he he would want to like cling to him. And he did want to cling to him. And this is why the chariots of fire came. You know, and, and, and we read this scripture. It says, huh, in uh, 2 Kings 2, 9, you know, it says, when they crossed over Elijah, said to Elisha, ask, what, what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you? And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken, it, it shall be so for you. But if not, it will not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked. Suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horse, a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and this separated the two of them. The chariots of fire did chariot of fire didn't come and take up Elijah's, you know, sometimes we think that. But it came and it separated the father and the son. And it separated the generation and it caused Elisha because Elisha had been following after Elijah, even when Elijah said like, just no, just wait, just stay like, you know, go go here. I'm going to go on there. And Elisha said, no, I will not. I will follow you, you know, and the chariots of fire come and they bring in that, that separation. And then the whirlwind comes and takes Elijah up and he catches the mantle. But what does Elisha say? He cries out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen, my father, my father. And guys, I feel like this is a moment. This is, this is part of this, this transition point that we're at. This is part of what some of us have been experiencing. It is, it's a coming of age time. It's a time of maturing. It's a time of stepping up into our place. It's a time of coming out of the cycles and the places of childhood that we have been stuck in. It is a place of maturing. And there's Elisha and he's crying out, my father, my father. Can you feel the grief in his heart. But he needed his father to go. He needed Elijah to be taken up so that he could receive the inheritance because you don't get to take hold of and taste of the inheritance unless there is a death first. There is a death, there is a painful ending before you can step into the beautiful new beginning that God has for you. And that's what Elisha was experiencing, the painful death, 
before the beautiful new beginning and it was a deep sense of loss and there was a sense of grief you know and he you know the bible doesn't say a whole lot about what he experienced but he was a human and you know even jesus wept when lazarus died so i imagine that you know elisha had some feels when his you know father was taken up And a lot of us are going through some feels. A lot of you are going through some deep pain, some grief, some closure, some endings. As God is shifting, he has been shifting. We are in that hallway of transition. It has started in February expected to continue into April. And then in April, you are going to find yourself sitting at new places, at new tables, and you are going to wonder, how did I get here? And you're going to see that the pain and the things and the realignments and the things that you have had to walk through that have grieved you to the depths of your soul, you're going to understand, you're going to understand God's wisdom in his purposes in his plans yeah but there is a need to partner with this prophetic word so what do we do how do we make sure that we successfully transition into this next season how do we make sure that we're ready and we're there like elisha could not get the double portion if he didn't see Elijah taken up. He had to follow him. He had to follow him and he had to watch. And it probably would have just been easier to just say goodbye and walk. But no, he followed and he waited and he knew. And people kept saying like, oh, you know, you're, you're going to lose your dad. You're going to, he's, he's gone. He's going, oh, the Lord's going to, prophets kept saying like, he, the Lord's going to take him away from you this day. And he's like, be quiet. I know. But he clung to him. And he stayed there as he wanted the inheritance. And there was an incredible spiritual transference that happened. You know, and there is... um. There are things on the inside of us. There are impartations that you have received from spiritual parents, even through the laying on of hands. There are prophetic words that are like, you know, because the word of God, when it's a true word of God, the word of God is incorruptible. He's faithful to perform it. So some of us, you have that incorruptible word of God, whether it came through, you know, the scripture in a verse that the Lord promised you or through, you know, a prophetic word that you received that you took as your own. There are those words, those promises on the inside of you, and they are going to come to fruition. But there, but it's not without pain. And it's not without process. But the Lord says, I will not waste your pain. And I will be with you in the process. So cling to me. Cling to me. And the transitions are happening and they're happening quickly. And they're going to happen rapidly. And some of them, um, it's like you, you know it's coming. You haven't seen it in the natural, but you can feel it in your heart. And God has actually been shifting. Um, he's been shifting your heart. He's been working. He's been doing deep, deep, deep healing in a lot of us. And he has been, he, he's been maturing us. He's been taking us through a process so that we will not cling to that which he doesn't want, want us to have because of our childish desire. And I, and I don't mean that in like an insulting way, but even just as like Elisha is the child, is the son, was like my father, my father, my father, that clinging, just wanting to cling to his father, you know, that heart of the child that wants to be taken care of it. But at the same time, we're at this coming of age. 
It's a coming of age moment. And we have to let go. We have to let go. Yeah. And in the letting go, though, (laughs) we have to make sure. So there's a lot of shift. There's a lot of realignment. There's a lot of connection. You can feel some of it in your heart. Some of it has been happening externally to you in relationships, just simply that you're just not connecting with the same people. And there's relationships that have fallen off and there's ones that are no longer reaching out to you. And and there's this realignment and just notice it. It feels very, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, unsettled kind of feeling and kind of a sense of like, where where are things going to land? But we're going to see where things are landing in these next few months. But we have to keep our eyes fixed on him. And we have to make sure that we have a pure heart that is free from offense. Because I heard the Lord warn me, Jenny... It's not just enough to be in the right place or to be out of a place. It's about the connection of your heart. So God might want to move you somewhere or keep you somewhere. But the heart posture is so important in this season. In promotion is going to be given based on the purity and condition of our hearts. It's not going to be given based on what people think of us or how we can appear outwardly, but it is going to be between you and God and what he sees on the inside. And he needs us to see that this is not a flesh and blood battle. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are not our enemies. But there are principalities and powers in high places. That have maneuvered things and have worked situations. And at times used our brothers and sisters in Christ as though pawns sometimes using us even. But people are not our enemies. And so we need to rightly discern what is the battle of this season. Because we have wearied ourselves. I'm going to go back to the verse I started with in Jeremiah 12, 5. We have wearied ourselves with the footmen. And we're not supposed to be fighting with the footmen. And we can't afford to weary ourselves with the footmen any longer because it is a time to contend with the horses. It is a time for another level of kingdom assignment and advancement. So we can't waste our energy anymore. Our alignments are very important in this season. There are tables that you are being invited to take a seat at, and there are tables that you need to step back from and move away because it cannot advance your kingdom assignment in this season. And it's not about right or wrong, good or bad, anything of that. It's about what God has called you to do, And someone else might be called to something that is very good and be moving in a very noble kingdom direction and be going right in the right direction that they're supposed to go. But if that is not part of your assignment and you stay hinged out of a false sense of loyalty and you allow that to not get you fully into your place, you're going to miss out. We have to have our ears to heaven to hear. Ears to heaven to hear. You know, I see there's 17 people on this call right now. I keep getting 17 people 
on my Facebook lives because 17 is a victory. It is time for victory. It is time for advancement. It is time for moving forward. And it is such an exciting time to be alive, guys. It's so, so exciting. If you're just tuning in now, go back. Go back when, when this, this is done and re-listen to what I've been releasing, guys. We need to like have our, our mind so set in this season. Because between now, February, March, April, this pivot point, this pivot point can mark your life. It can bring an exponential acceleration or a needless delay in another trip around the mountain. I don't want to take another trip around the mountain. I don't want to walk around another obstacle, another challenge, go through another trial or another test because I failed to stick with it and pass the test the first time. So we need to be intentional. And we need to know when he says to stay and we need to know when he says to go. And we have to know that as we come in and we come out, that the Lord is with us. And we have to learn how to come in, go out, you know, horizontally. But he's also, there's also this thing of, this, a thing of uh, Jacob's ladder just keeps coming to me. You know, this thing of ascension, you know, everyone keeps saying it's the year of ascension. So that's, you know, not my own. But it's like this, the heavens are open. And our victory is in realizing it's not a flesh and blood battle. So for me, what that looks like, you know, just as an example, um, you know, as someone who launched the first Emerging Prophets school in Canada last month, you know, so as someone who is a Canadian who is emerging as a prophet and is trying to do, is doing something of significance in Canada, in the prophetic I am experiencing, you know, some of the, the higher level, you know, so I talked about last week about the tall poppy syndrome. So there's this Canadian tall poppy thing. There's the false humility. There's the like pushing down of people who try to rise up. There's our religious, um, you know, climate in this nation that's been really resistant to the prophetic. There's, there's other things. And so we have to understand what it is we're coming against. And I heard this great little nugget of wisdom from Keith Fronte in our masterclass today. And he was talking about whatever the, the, the enemy that's coming against you, whatever the spirit is, you need to fight by coming in the opposite spirit. And so one of the things... Um, <laughs> One of the things that, um, you know, might be going around would be, um, you know, say there's gossip, slander, witchcraft, people tearing you down, that kind of thing. Like, how do you combat that? Like, you know, you get caught up in people saying negative things of, about you and you just feel, you know, that coming. What do you do? Well, the mistake would be to get up, caught up into fight accusation with accusation. I, I did that once and I don't want to do that again. I've probably done it more than once, but like do not fight the enemy with the enemy's tactics. And don't defend yourself, but you need to come against it with the opposite spirit. And so if there is a witchcraft spirit, which has to do with cursing and speaking against and speaking negatively, bring honor. Bless those who curse you. This is the most powerful. These are the weapons of our warfare that are kingdom. And we need to ascend that ladder that like, you know, Jacob's ladder was like a picture of Jesus. Jesus opened the heavens for us so that we don't just live here. You know, so 
I, we could live here in the second heaven and we can get all this intel, especially those of us who are feelers. I feel like, you know, we feel and we sense what is going on, especially my prophet friends. Like we, you can sense what's going on. You can pick it up, but you can get feel so beat up if you just stay down here in the feeling realm. We need to ascend. We need to go up higher because in this place is where the answer is. In this place, which is through intimacy, is the place of victory where we get the strategies from heaven. Because when we rise up into our rightful place where we are seated with Christ on high, the strategies that we're gonna get in that place are gonna have nothing to do with backbiting, accusation, or using the enemy's tactics or warring in the flesh. They're all gonna be, be, be about releasing the atmosphere of heaven into the situation. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the weapon. That is our strategy. I'm going to have to listen. So I'm going to have to go back and listen to this because I'm prophesying to myself as well. Um, <laughs> I might have to, you know, take notes and, you know, re-listen to this. But guys, it's such an exciting time. It is an exciting, exciting time. This is a time of advancing. It is a time of of fighting. It is a time of taking new territory and, and, and advancing the kingdom, but we don't take new territory without slaying the giants. But as we're getting ready, guys, check your heart. Just check her heart. Check her heart. Is there anybody you need to forgive? I had to forgive some people, you know, a couple weeks ago. And, you know, sometimes we think, you know, we think we forgive or we're like, we forgave. We forgive like a hundred times. Like, how do I need to? But it's like, you know, we forgive, we forgive. And then as soon as the, that, that tormenting spirit comes with the whispering lies and the narrative starts to cycle, the battles in your mind and the narrative starts to spin and it starts to cycle. And the enemy is just waiting for you to give your agreement to it. Because as soon as you give your agreement to the lies of the enemy, he's got a foothold in and then you you step into, if you step into offense or unforgiveness, then you have to go around again and release the forgiveness. And guys, there's something um, else I learned really powerful about forgiveness in this last year. Because I always like understood the concept. John and Carol are not. Um, they wrote a really incredible book on um, grace and forgiveness. It's just a short little thing, but so like so powerful. And so I know that like, I, I need to forgive because like, if you don't forgive, your father cannot forgive you because you can't, he can't extend grace for you if you demand justice for someone else. So as long as you are saying, no, I won't forgive them. I want them to have what they deserve. God has to say, well, then I have to give you what you deserve. Unless we extend grace, he cannot extend grace. That's so why the man who was forgiven his great debt and then refused to forgive the debt of his servant was handed over to the tormentors. But about forgiveness, the point, other point was sometimes, sometimes we can mentally assent to forgive and I've done this, you know, and cause we know it's the right thing to do. And we know that God requires of it of us and it's the right thing to do. And, you know, we know that's the way forward. And so we just, yep, yeah, I forgive them. I'm done, you know, release them, you know, but you know why sometimes it doesn't like fully, fully go away. You know, because sometimes these offenses that we encounter or these wounds, you know, where the enemy, you know, whether, you know, often through it's through a person where the enemy knows what our weaknesses are, knows, knows where to get us, always tries to hit us where it hurts, you know, and so sometimes we have these, you know, we need to pursue healing and always go after healing, but sometimes we have these inner child parts that have woundedness from our developmental years. And so sometimes it's like the adult 
intellectual, grown-up part of us can say, okay, yeah, I forgive you, I forgive you. But sometimes those wounds hit to the depths of those parts of us that we don't always acknowledge. And sometimes those parts of us don't even, like, aren't, aren't as sanctified as our adult parts. And so sometimes we need to allow ourselves to not just mentally assent to forgive and to release, but to actually allow the part of us that was hurt, the part, the part that's maybe still wounded, still feels raw, the part where it really penetrated to feel the pain of the offense and what happened. And from that place of pain, out of that deep place to release forgiveness and to invite Jesus in. And sometimes that is the breakthrough that you need so that you don't have to keep going around that mountain where you're like, but I forgave them. Like I forgave them like 770 times, you know, like the Bible, <laughs> seven times seven, just like the Bible said, but you, it just keeps coming back. Sometimes that's the key. Yeah, but there's healing and there's healing that is available. And, and guys go through the process because there are exciting, beautiful places for you. You know, we are spiritually in times of war. We need to know, know the weapons of our warfare. We need to put on our armor. We need to know who the enemy is and who is on our team. And so spoiler, like, okay, everybody in the body of Christ is on your team. So we're not fighting our brothers and sisters. The enemy is spiritual. We need to fight spiritually. But love that Psalm 23 where it says that the Lord makes a table for us. Sorry, I got to get a little more comfortable. He makes a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And so this is, you know, what we're getting aligned for and getting set up for because... Um, yeah, he wants to move us to new tables. And I know I said this before, but love a prophetic word that Sammy Robinson gave me back in August. And, you know, he said part of my calling was to help people find their place at the table. And so I want to help people find their place at the table. And that's the power in the prophetic. You know, in God, the, the power of the, you know, the prophet is, it's such a gift you know, so because you get to look past a person and where they're at and you get to see and call out God's original design and intent for their life and help them to find their place. You know, some of you guys are trying so hard to be accepted and, and, and you know, <laughs> I'll put my hand up. You know, some of us, we try so hard to fit in and be accepted and sometimes we get this, you know, orphan mentality because we don't fully, we aren't fully settled in our sonship, our sonship or daughtership. And just knowing that like, first and foremost, like guys, we have so much value. We're so incredibly loved and valued it has nothing to do with our position, it has nothing to do with anything that we do. It's just because our daddy loves us. And so we got to let that settle really, really, really deeply because some of us in our unsettledness and who we are in that sense of like, cause orphans don't really know that they belong and they don't know that their father is going to take care of them. So there is that sense that like desperation of like, who will love me? Who will accept me? Where is my place? Do I belong? Am I safe? And so God is wanting to break us out of these cycles of painful questioning where it's like, where do I fit? Where do I belong? And misalignments and being in the wrong place because we went there for the wrong motivation. You know, maybe you found acceptance, but then when the acceptance was removed, you just realized that you were just left there like an orphan. And God is saying that, you know, your acceptance is in me. And so know who you are. Yeah. And I love that Tamara 
that he's anointing our heads with oil. He's anointing our heads with oil. Yeah, that's Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside green pastures. Who? Or he leads me beside still waters. <laughs> so I'm going to misquote it. But he restores my soul, leads me in the paths of righteousness. I'm quoting it all out of order. You know, but the table in the presence of our, he's setting that table for us in the presence of our enemies and we can know. You know, his goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life and we will dwell in his house. The table in the presence of the enemies is our ability to fellowship with him, to commune with him in, in, in now, to commune with him, fellowship with him up there. It's about this ability to ascend. It doesn't matter what is going on around us. We know that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Goodness and mercy will follow us, not just after we die, but now, all the days of our life. Now. Now you are protected. Now you are in a place of safety. Now the Lord is pulling out the chair for you to sit at the right table. Now you have your double portion. Now there is a banqueting feast that he is setting before you. Whew. Yeah. Now. You know, so I talked about Elisha in that, that grief in his heart. You know, that like my father, my father, when Elijah was taken up. My father, my father. You know, and sometimes we go through these painful seasons and, you know, in James, that like consider it pure joy when you face various trials. Oh, who loves that verse? I, I did not understand that for most of my Christian life. How can you be in trial and consider it joy? I just didn't get it. I'm starting to get it now, you know, but it's like, so in this painful place of grief and loss where he lost his spiritual father but he had to to receive the inheritance inheritance only comes when there is death when there is a loss but then so you're no longer this the child you become the adult and this is this is i i said this before it's it's a coming of age thing elisha was like Give me the double portion. I want the double portion. Like a firstborn son, I want the double portion of the firstborn. He was taking his place. He knew his identity as a spiritual son, even though he was not a natural son of Elijah. But he wanted his inheritance and he went after it but he had to be willing to let go of his father. And so there are things that the Lord is shifting out of our life. We're coming of age. There is a growing up and to step in and to receive, to receive the portion that is set aside for firstborn child this inheritance that is incorruptible, indestructible. There are new mantles. There are gifts. There are anointings. There are things that are inside of you and they're so deeply locked in there and God is unlocking you. He is unlocking you. You know, this is a year of the open door, but it's not just the open door of opportunity. It is opening up the door of your heart and pulling out, releasing what has been locked up inside. In knowing, so this coming of age, the adult son loses his father, he becomes the father. Elijah was the lone ranger prophet crying in a cave, God, kill me, I'm all by myself, Jezebel's after me. And he's like, you need family, you need son, go anoint Elisha. You know, so Eli Elijah anoints Elisha, Elisha serves him, but when he becomes the, then he becomes the father because Elijah's gone and Elisha anoints prophets and raises up companies of prophets. 
He takes his double portion, firstborn spiritual inheritance, but he had to know who he was. And it's only in knowing who you are as a son that you can become a mother or a father in the spirit. And God is looking for spiritual parents in this season. We need spiritual parents because what is the ministry of Elijah in Malachi? It is a ministry of reconciliation, returning the hearts of the sons and the daughters to the father. How do you take the orphan sons and daughters and make them the orphans and make them sons and daughters? You can't, you can only reproduce what you are. And so if you are an orphan to the core, if you don't have sonship resting on you, if you are an orphan, you will raise up a bunch of orphans. So we need to get healthy. We need to get strong because we need to be mothers and fathers who are raising up other true sons and daughters who know their God and know that he is so for them. It's not about their performance, but it is just about their position as his children. Yeah. Wow. It's so exciting. Wow. Man, I just... I just want to release to you. Yeah. God, let a spirit of wisdom and revelation come. God, let that spirit of wisdom and revelation come. And let that wisdom and revelation so illuminate their hearts. God, that they would know what you're saying no to and what you're saying go to. God, that it would be like a red light or a green light in the spirit that there would be such clarity. God, that you would shut so firmly those doors that you don't want to be opened. God, and that you would swing wide the doors that you want them to walk through. And God, that you would give us the stamina so that we can contend with the horses. God, that we will succeed now in the floodplains of the Jordan, in this time of stepping into our promised land and our inheritance. In this time of battle, where we're fighting the giants and we're pulling down the strongholds. God, that you would release the strategies of heaven to each and every one. God, that we would not, that we would not wrestle with humans, that we would not consider our brothers and sisters adversaries, but God, that we would know what to say yes to and where to move, that we would know our assignment and our place in the process, God, and that you would have your way. God, have your way. Have your way. Yeah. Who? Yeah, and God, let that spirit of adoption, (laughs) let that spirit of adoption come. God, we thank you for the spirit of adoption. God, and let it rest. Let that spirit of adoption just come and settle on each and every one. God, that they would just feel feel it, that they would feel it, that they would feel that sense of, I'm so divinely loved and accepted that I am his and he is mine and I have nothing to prove and nothing can take that away. But God, let them know that they're chosen, that they're called for such a time as this. Yeah. Who? Yeah. You know, I just feel such a, there's such a deep settling. There's just such a deep, deep settling. And so just let things settle. The direction that we need in this season is only going to come from a place of rest. 
And it's actually a time, you know, we have to be so in a place of rest and humility. Some of it, so it's all going to, like, there's rest that is needed, but there's also this needfulness of, um, there's a needfulness of community. And there's going to be a needfulness to have safe people that you can bounce things off of. Because we're in this time where alignment is very important and we feel some things opening and we feel some things closing. But we all have blind spots. And so do not be so puffed up in pride that you don't realize that you could be deceived by your own understanding. And there is going to be a needfulness to have wisdom, which is why I was like wisdom and revelation. But but also there is a wisdom that only comes in the multitude of counselors. If you are alone and you are making all your life decisions on your own, you will be deceived. And you'll be easy for the enemy to pick off. Because our hearts want to go where the affirmation is and where it feels comfortable and where there's like lots of, you know, acceptance. But that's like, you know, orphans are led by that way. But we need to be so fully affirmed and accepted and loved that we're not moved and we're not like misled by our affections. So we need wisdom. And you need to have people in your life speaking into you. People who are, you know, mothers and fathers. Yeah, and we need those mothers and fathers so that, you know, we can learn what it is to be a mother and father. Yeah. Ah, so good. Wow, thanks guys for tuning in. Last, you know what, last thing I just wanted to mention, um, first I want to say hello to a few of you guys. Crystal Lee, Chelsea Jackson, Cherie Gaither, Julianne August, Murray Hancock, Cassidy, Mikula, Patty Ann, Barb Dixon. Good. Thanks guys so much for tuning in. So we got 17 people watching again. 17 is just, you know, it's time, it's victory time. And this is like, we are operating from a place of victory. And so let's stay there in that place of victory. And that's the ascension and learning how to get above the noise and come up here to get our strategies for moving forward. You know, I just wanted to invite you guys in. I mentioned it last week, but I'm offering a discount on the prophetic mentorship group that I run. And um, so I, I've been running this for almost two years. I've had about 40 students, maybe just over 40 students come through it since we launched back in May 2022. And some of those people who've come through it are now in my Emerging Prophet School. But um, I love training people in the prophetic, whether you're called to be a prophet or not. The prophetic is for everyone. Joel 2 talks about like, you know, in the last days, the spirit being poured out on all flesh and sons and daughters would prophesy. It is in the heart of God that we would all prophesy. That's also in 1 Corinthians 14, like, per, like pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. And why is it prophecy though? It is foretelling and forth telling. It's not just about like, you know, accessing spiritual information. It's about intimacy. It's about going through Jesus into the spirit realm and knowing the heart of the father and receiving his heart and his words and his wisdom and his guidance for your life. You know, and so I am passionate about raising up prophetic generations. I want to raise up multitudes of people with the prophetic word in their mouth. And I also am called to raise up prophets, but you know, anyone in the body of Christ, if you would like to grow in the prophetic would like to sharpen your skills, you know, so I meet, I do this mentorship group on Monday evenings from seven to 9 PM. So we do a two hour zoom call every week. So Lane strong, strong new covenant foundations for what is the healthy prophetic for, for today, the, the foundation of the prophetic in the context of intimacy with God. What does that look like? 
who is God, knowing who is God and knowing who you are in God. Those are two of the most important belief systems that you're going to have is what you think about him and what you think about you. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if you're believing lies about yourself, you are going to live out of those lies and they will become your truth. And so guys, if you are not, if you're not connected to a prophetic community, if you're not connected to a church that is prophetic and you would like to grow or you just like access with it, you like to learn about it, join us for, for six months of mentorship. Usually the cost is $500 uh, until next week it is going to be 444. I love numbers. So 444. And I'm going to put a link to the um, application in the comments. And this isn't just for people here in Canada. The mentorship group is international. I have a student from Germany. I have student in students in Hawaii, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Newfoundland, British Columbia, and then multiple in, in Ontario. I've also had in the past student from Quebec. I've had a couple of people who English isn't even their first language um, and they've done incredibly. So I would love to see this group expand. And so if this word tonight has resonated with you, if it stirred something on the inside of you and you're just like, man, I felt like I was so dry, but this is igniting my passion and I know there's something more. If you are wanting to transition and be rightly aligned for this next season, if you're like, I don't have any mentors, I don't really, you know, have, you know, people speaking into me, come and be part of this prophetic community. I would love the privilege of teaching you speak and speaking into your life. And I do prophesy over students, but it's not just about me prophesying over people. It's about me teaching you and helping you learn that you can too access the voice of God. Because just like I'm a daughter, you're a daughter or you're a son as well. Join us. I want to see this group grow. I want to see some new, fresh, excited people join us this coming week. So I would love to see you. All right. Thanks guys so much for tuning in. Have an awesome evening. Bless you.